I know that everybody loves Back to the Future, but for a boy like me, the film was something else. It was the promise of a future that I was going to live. A future of bright consumers. The symbol of all those great things that were in that film is this, the overboard. For me, I couldn't wait. I couldn't wait to ride one. So I was patient at first. I waited. 2015 came. You know that the film is supposed to happen in 2015, and still no overboard for me. So why? I know you know why. I know you think I'm a simpleton. It's a film. Of course, it's not supposed to happen. But crazier things happened in that film. Crazier prediction. Like the rise of Donald Biff Trump. The film predicted that. And look at this scene at the dinner table. This is the Marty McFly family of the future. And they have those headsets, VR headsets. And you know when Facebook bought the Oculus? Around 2015. So this happened. So why? Why not the overboard? Well, you think this scene is not about VR, actually. It's the mirror of another scene that is happening in the first film, and it's about screen consumption. So in 1955, there's only one single TV set for the family. In 1985, uh, where Marty, Marty McFly, is supposed to live, he tells the family that he has two TV sets at his place. One is in his bedroom, and they are totally amazed by that. They actually don't even believe him. And in the future, we have one screen per family members. The smartphone was invented. There's no smartphone in Back to the Future, but there's no denial that today we behave like that. So the film didn't lie. So enough about the McFly family. I will tell you a little bit about my family now and about their smartphone consumption. So first, my father. You see, my father, he doesn't like the smartphone. He hates it. We could say that my father is a hater. But he loves his car. And in his car, there's a GPS. And this thing is pretty expensive to update. So one day, he got lost. He was bringing my daughter to the sport practice, and he got lost. It was very embarrassing for him. So I managed to convince him to buy a smartphone because the GPS there was updated and always accurate. So my father moved to the smartphone for the GPS function. Why? Because it was useful. On the other hand, my brother, I have a brother, I have two brothers. My brother he had to migrate from a world where the smartphone didn't exist. At the beginning, he did my one. He was not an early adopter. But then he started to work, and at work, he had a computer, and on his computer, he had emails. And because his work was so demanding, after work, he needed emails as well. So he had to buy a smartphone because he needed it to access his emails. And once he got the smartphone, he started using it, using other apps. So my brother is an immigrant. And for immigrants, the key word is the need. But you see, he has his smartphone, and he's totally fine with the native app that is on the smartphone, which is not the case of my wife. My wife, she's more of an explorer. She's very curious. She's in this room. And uh, she keeps testing new apps. She will try one email program, and then another one, and then another one, and she will not stay for very long with a single app. Why? Because the key word for her is the curiosity. So where do I stand in this family portrait? I'm here, and I'm the leader. Of course, I come up with those names, so <laughs> I chose the leader for myself. <laughs> Take my email consumption. I will never stay with the native app of my phone. Actually, I will use six different apps, 32 rules, and a whole ecosystem that I will constantly optimize to achieve my goal. And my goal is mailbox zero. Every day, I want my 200 emails to be totally dispatched and treated. So it's a very, a very different type of consumption. It's a consumption that is constantly optimized. So the key word for the leader is optimization. But it's not the only key word. There's a second one. Because you see, for every leader out there, there's a nemesis. It's a little bit like superheroes. 
And the nemesis, it's that friend, you know, when you post a trailer online, he will tell you, oh my god, you're only posting this now? I saw that this morning. You're always late with your nemesis. He's competing with you. He's trying to be the leader instead of you. So the second keyword, and it's a very important one for the leader, is the competition. This is where the money is. You will spend a lot of money, a lot of time, a lot of energy to maintain your position at the lead. But the leader is not the king of that business. The king of that business is the native. You see, I also have a daughter. She's here in this room as well, and she's 11 years old. And it's a bit complicated to understand how she uses a smartphone. Of course, she doesn't email yet. But, you know, she uses it for various different things, and I was so frustrated to see her watch those crappy videos uh, on the smartphone. So one day, she must have been four or five years old at the time, I literally dragged her to the cinema. You see, I work in films. You don't watch a film on a smartphone. So we arrived at the cinema, and she was bored almost right away. And I tried to entertain her, and there were commercials on the screen. And I told her, look, look at the size of the screen. It's amazing. We don't have that at home. And she said, Dad, come on. I take the smartphone or the tablet, I do this, and the screen is even bigger. <laughs> and she's right. She was right. So I couldn't find, at the time, a keyword for the natives. And I told to myself, you know what? That's the challenge. You will have to keep observing her. Keeping track with them is the most difficult thing. So no keyword for the native. <laughs> so here you have five different profiles for five different types of consumers. They're all in my family, and I think that you know that they're in your family as well. Actually, they're in this room. They're everywhere. What is ama amazing with the theory is that there are no more than five profiles. These five profiles, they work for the crowd, they work for everyone. They work for everything, and they work any time. i give you another example. We talked about smartphone, let's talk about something entirely different. Let's talk about dancing. So, let's say we are in different time frame, I would say 1955, okay? So you're a student in Hill Valley. It's 1955, where are you going to dance? Enchantment under the sea, the prom ball, okay? Okay, if you don't know, in the film Back to the Future, the first one, this is where Marty McFly ends up playing the song by Chuck Berry, Johnny Be Good, on stage, even before Chuck Berry has wrote it. So let's analyze that scene a little bit. Marty is on stage, he's giving a few instructions to the band, because they don't know the song yet, and the band, they are the immigrants. The first people dancing is the band in that scene. Then after that, the crowd, the students, they hear about it, they start dancing. For them, it's quite normal. They are at prom, they are there to dance, they will just dance, easy. But some of those students, they are not there just to shake their body. They are there to own the dance floor. This kind of dance that you see there, this is not regular dancing, this is acrobatic dancing. Those people are optimizing their dance, and they compete with one another. Where is the Aether? When Marty ends up the song, it goes heavy metal a little bit. There's one person in that room that didn't like at all what he did, and this is Strickland. The song ends, Strickland is like this, he hated it, but he's there, and Marty has no choice. He has to play in front of the Aether as well. What is important here is that you see those four profiles? The song works so well. It works in the film. It works for you. This scene is a cult scene. It works for every generation because Marty is targeting not one profile, not just the native, all of them. And you know who is the most important profile there? It's the explorer. Marvin, the cousin of Chuck Berry, is backstage and he hears the song and he's very curious about it. He calls Chuck Berry and says, listen to this. Without the explorer, in that scene, no Johnny Be Good. Okay? So I kind of demonstrated the theory at a different time. Let's try to apply it to the overboard. Not really useful, not really optimized. How am I going to compete with this? 
Actually, I don't need it. I never did. So how come? How come I wanted it so bad? What do you think? Someone in the film needed it badly. And that person is Marty McFly. You see, Marty McFly is an immigrant in the future. And when he arrives, he's in a brawl with Biff and his gang. And he has to escape because they are much more powerful than him. So he's in need. He exits the bar, and then he realizes that there are a bunch of girls with kick scooters. You see? Kick scooters. It's not even a hoverboard, it's not even a skateboard. It's a toy for girls. This is what I ended up wanting so bad. It's kind of disappointing. So what does Marty do? As a leader, in one second, he takes a kick scooter, he optimizes it, he turns it to a skateboard. Boom, just like that. For what? To compete with his nemesis, Biff. But Biff, he has the ultimate flying skateboard. He has the pit bull. Do you remember the pit bull? I didn't. So how come I ended up wanting the overboard and not the pit bull? The pit bull would have been the ultimate toy for me. My expectations were a bit low. Why? Because of cinema, because of peer influence. This is the key word for the natives. I was influenced by Marty McFly. Identification, okay? So a few years back, my daughter, her again, she comes to me and she said, Dad, I want a hoverboard. And I'm like, what? You want an hoverboard? Yes, all my friends have one. I want one. Let's go. Let's buy one. Turn it up that she wanted this. <laughs> not really what I had in mind. So I was like, it's not possible. How come that they call this an hoverboard? How is it possible that those expectations are so low? And then it, it rang a bell with me. I mean, expectations, I don't know if you're familiar with this, the Gartner curve. It's the hype cycle. And Gartner says that all technologies, they are on that curve, and uh, it's supposed to explain the hype. And I don't see the overboard on that curve. And the thing is that technology should not be on that curve. Technology is the curve. And technologies are coming one after the other in a very accelerated way now. The gap between the curves is getting smaller and smaller with time. So you see, one of the axes is expectations. The other one is time. And the natives, they are at the crossroads of all those influences. It creates a very complex thing. The good news is that, of course, if you want to target natives, you have to go through influencers. You know, they are under influence. You need to find influencers. And those that are peer influencers, I'm not able to influence my daughter. But the good news is that the natives, they have lower expectations, meaning they are easier to satisfy than most of the other profiles. You see the other profiles, they are on the upper side of the curves. The bad news is that you cannot beat time. And the native status is something that is quite ephemeral. When Marty goes heavy metal on the song, the band stops. The crowd stops dancing as well. He's alone. Why? Because he's too soon. And he will tell it afterwards. He will say, your kids, they're going to love it. So time. How do you solve time? Because, you know, the 12 years old that I was never got to become the consumer of that future. And what the film is teaching us is that even if you have a time machine, even if you come up with a flux capacitor, time will always be an issue. They're always late in that film. They're always out of time. But the future is bright. So, as it was said a few years ago, I met with Bob Gale. He's the writer of the Back to the Future trilogy. And sitting with him, he told me a nice anecdote. He told me that when he was 12, he went to the cinema and he saw James Bond flying a jetpack. And it was amazing for him, but he never got to try one. When I was 12, Bob Gale was the age that I have today on this stage. And he ended up making a film that not only inspired this talk, but inspired 30 years of a generation of future enthusiasts. 
So yes, the future is bright, because my daughter, you see, she will turn 12 next year. And I still have a good chance to create something that will inspire her for the 30 years to come. Not by behaving like a consumer, but by behaving like a creator that understands them. Bob Gale told me something else. He told me, you know, I'm too old anyway. I will never fly a jetpack because I'm too old. And I told him, no, you're not. You're not too old. I'm not too old either to ride an overboard. It's just that those things, they don't fit our profile. And I know what you think. You're thinking, yeah, you're probably too chicken to even try. But I will tell you something. Nobody calls me chicken. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.